Good, good morning, everyone, and, and good afternoon to Dr. McGill McGillchrist. Um, I'm Patrick McCluskey. I'm the editor of Dakota Digital Review. Um, this is, I brought a different publication than last time, so if you'd like to pick some up, they're over there. Um, anyway, welcome to today's event, The Divided Brain, the Humanities, and Artificial Intelligence, with Dr. Ian McGillchrist, who is joining us from Scotland. Uh, this discussion is sponsored by the Northern Plains Ethics Institute for a Public Forum, NDSU's College of Arts and Sciences, Tri-College University, the Dakota Digital Academy, and Crosswinds Institute. And a special thanks to Professor Cooley and his students here who watched the posted interview of Dr. McGillchrist, which was conducted by today's moderators, uh, Michael Robinson, a professor of psychology, Todd Pringle, who is completing his, his doctorate in psychology. Um, and as uh, Todd mentioned, uh, Professor Cooley's students submitted questions, uh, which we will pose during the discussion. Uh, Ian McGilchrist started his career as a literary scholar at Oxford University, and then became a medical doctor, psychiatrist, and neuroscientist. He is now the world-renowned author of two books, um, one is The Master and His Emissary, uh, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. The second book, which came out uh, a few years ago, The Matter with Things, and this is actually one book. If you don't have dumbbells, you can just buy it and you know you can use that. It's Our Brains, Our Delusions, and the Unmaking of the World. A uh, million words altogether, but absolutely brilliant and worthwhile, uh, worthwhile <laughs> reading. Um, Anyway, uh, also I'll let our moderators begin and enjoy the discussion. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Robinson, in psychology professor, of psychology, and me and Todd uh, got the chance to interview Ian uh, a month ago or so, um, and we're just uh, doing a follow up. Uh, so, okay, so this uh, we'll start with some student questions. Um, you're obviously very knowledgeable when it comes to both hemispheres of the brain and many other things. How did you develop such a novel perspective of the two hemispheres and their processing modes and the interaction of, of the hemispheres with culture and so forth? Hmm. That's a question I, I to me. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah, a little bit of uh, maybe your history and how you were yeah. able to combine different uh, studies. That sure, you, sure. Uh, no, I, I, can, I can say something about that. Um, just before I start, I'd like to... Um, unburden the audience from the feeling of a million words. It is actually 591,000 words, <laughs> which is already an enormous number, but it's slightly more manageable than a million. Anyway, um, yeah. Well, I suppose it was because of philosophical questions that interested me since um, I was a teenager, really. And uh, they led me through the study of the humanities to wonder what we were doing in the university when we were, for example, um, dealing with a, a supposedly helping to understand the work of literature. And um, I wrote a book about why I thought we got that process wrong called Against Criticism, <laughs> which was like uh, taking an enormous gun and shooting your foot off. Um, and uh, I decided that <laughs> that was the time to uh, disappear from the academy. No, I, I'm joking. I, what happened was that, <laughs> what happened was that, um, I saw that there was something about the way we thought, and indeed the way we think generally as a culture now, which was disembodied, uh, decontextualized, abstract, categorized, and uh, as it were, um, to do with types not to do with individual cases. Unfortunately, when it comes to works of art or even people that you know, they're not well represented by just taking a box of a category. They're actually unique. And so we miss the uniqueness and we miss the context and we miss what is really very important, that a lot of meaning is not explicit, it's implicit. And when I uh, had trained in medicine in order to understand the mind-body relationship better, because I thought it's too disembodied the way the philosophers do this for me. Uh, I, I found that in fact the hemispheres 
are different in ways which cast light on the problem I had been writing about and thinking about ever since, which is that the right hemisphere alone seems to understand implicit meaning. The right hemisphere alone seems to understand the unique case rather than simply the type or category. And the right hemisphere alone seems to understand context. And context changes everything. Um, I, I sometimes, uh, excuse me for doing this, I'm just going to uh, tell you a little uh, American joke, okay? So in America, there are four sizes of cereal packets, yeah? The, the first of all is there is jumbo, which means very large. Then there is economy, which means large. Then there comes family, which means medium. And finally, there's large, which means small. So you see that context completely changes the meaning of anything. <laughs> and th these are ideas that have haunted me philosophically and led to the work that I've done, uh, trying to cast light on the way our society looks at the world and looks at human beings. And I realize that if at the moment, as I believe, we are listening mainly to the less intelligent, less imaginative left hemisphere, with its simple schema, rather than engaging with the real complexity of life. Had there been other times when we got the balance better? And that's the substance of the second half of The Master and His Emissary, in which I reviewed the main turning points in the history of ideas from the Greeks, through the Romans, through our own history from the Renaissance onwards. So that is, in essence, how I came from a background in the humanities to writing about this topic in neuroscience. In our talk, you talked about your work at the Bethlehem Royal um, with uh, where you'd looked at, uh, you know, what people's professions were and you noticed a preponderance of engineers and, and philosophers um, with some psychopathologies. Um, and that's the context. <laughs> of, that's the context of the question. The question is around, you know, do you think an engineering education inculcates the left hemisphere dominance and and if i could sort of more broadly tee it up um is a so all of almost everybody here are future engineering students are spending four or five six years in a world where there is a right answer and there's a mechanistic process to get down to that right answer um and then they're going to go out into the world and and live in a, a space and a and a um career uh and a, a work product you know that reinforces that to what, to what extent do you think the engineering education um, might be a strong driver of left hemisphere dominance? Or, and this is also a question that you have in the workplace about engineers, are they made or born? Um, to, yes. <laughs> to what, when, if you get an engineering degree, does that mean you, you, um, you got a bunch of engineering programming and now you can think like an engineer, or is it really you survived the cut filter and you were one to begin with, and those that didn't graduate uh, um, weren't. Um, but generally speaking, um, what are your thoughts on the education system and STEM education and engineering education for um, driving left hemisphere dominance? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the only facts I have here are that when I looked at patients who developed a psychosis in their late teens or early 20s, typically a time when they were at university, the two most popular subjects being studied by people who had a, a schizophrenic uh, episode or diagnosis were engineering and philosophy, as you've mentioned. I suspect that it's, like many things, a mixture of being born and being made. Um, and one of the reasons for thinking that it might be likely that people are naturally inclined to take these degree courses if they already have a certain cast of mind is that we think that if you look back at the history, the early developmental history, and certainly the, the through teens to adulthood history of development of individuals who develop a psychosis, you can see signs in retrospect of what was coming. So I think that, and we know that there is to an extent a genetic basis for schizophrenia uh, and there is a genetic basis for autism, which also in some of its manifestations is um, rather similarly technical and um, 
people with autism are often very good at dealing with explicit and technical matters, but less good at dealing with um, imprecise, um, intuitive, um, implicit matters. So I think there is a, a two-way thing there. Um, and it slightly worries me that in our mainstream education, the humanities, which are, you know, the clues in the name, <laughs> helping us to understand what it means to be a human being through studying literature, history, philosophy, and things that help us to think intelligently about what a human being is and what the world is, these are being downplayed in favor of what are really much more technical training in STEM subjects. So if, I hope that's an acceptable answer to that question. I have a question that's uh, related to that question, uh, less about education and uh, certain majors and more about the kinds of occupations that uh, say somebody who's left hemisphere dominant would gravitate toward and would reinforce those tendencies. Um, yes. The word politician came up um, in that context. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do you have any thoughts on the sorts of occupations that would be occupied by people who are uh, too too left hemispheric in their style? <laughs> well, accepting that, without wanting to unpack that that phrase, but um, accepting it for the time being, I think that they're more inclined towards administration than politics. Administration is very much a matter of developing linear procedures of the kind the left hemisphere is more at home with um, and following those and having rules as it were for situations and generalities of people rather than individual cases. So I think um, a politician, uh, some people have thought that politicians have a degree of psychopathy or sociopathy, if you like, uh, in them. And, and that may be true, um, uh, as do quite probably the, the CEOs of large corporations. But I think they're a different kind of animal. They're, um, it's more about uh, me, 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 and, <laughs> and about um, performing. Uh, the sort of things that actually the engineer is not necessarily so good at. I must say one of the terribly interesting things for me has been that, of course, lots of people have written to me from all walks of life to, to tell me how much my work is meant to them. And, you know, these include people such as a long distance lorry driver in Australia and a lavatory cleaner in Oxford, but also... <laughs> um, politicians and judges and so on, psychologists, philosophers. But one group that is very interesting is engineers who write to me and say, you know, after reading your book, I suddenly realize a whole lot of things about my life that I haven't understood. And now I kind of get it. And since reading your book, my wife tells me that I'm, <laughs> I'm a better person to be married to, and my job is going better, <laughs> and so on. So there's something going on there with engineers who certainly are not without insight into what it is I'm talking about. So, and I know you, you cite Schulteis in the book, um, who's done a work on need for power, right? And I got the feeling, yeah. I got the feeling that the, the, the left hemisphere had s sort of a need for power and to sort of instantiate yes. its own vision of reality on the social situation um but but you're you're linking the left brain style more to um uh, like you say administration Policy. and bureaucracy and things like that so well, does, yes does power does uh, power fit into the the calculus yes it does but i think the people who get filtered out of politics are people with any degree of decent reticence <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it tends to be people who are great performers and somewhat histrionic and, and this is a different um, group but certainly in terms of the values espoused by the hemispheres the left hemisphere's principal value is to be able to control and administration is in fact a manner, matter of control uh, it, it's whole um, 
evolutionary coming about, if you like, is in order to help us manipulate the world. Um, and this may not mean actually um, power in the very straightforward sense, though it often does mean that, but in the, an ability to determine and control outcomes. So, uh, you know, that I, I talk about values in my, in my work uh, as I get older and approach death, I think values become more and more important to me. They're often not talked about um, because they're not technical, but actually the values for which we live and towards which we are attracted, both as individuals and as a society, make a huge difference to what our lives are like and whether they're fulfilling or not. And I, I'm talking and writing at the moment lectures um, in Oxford, Cambridge, London, and in various places across America, in which some of what I will talk about is this question of values, that it's not just a matter of power. Power is at the bottom, if you like, of the values. Power for what is the next question? And that brings you back to other values. What are the values you want power in order to pursue? And it can't just be more power. And so we come back to the good old values of goodness and beauty and truth, which I fear in my lifetime have become degraded and despised, but are not only essential to a fulfilled human life, but to a fulfilling human society. The, the next one is more of a statement than a question. It is, is he a fan of Dr. Ian Malcolm from Jurassic Park? Do you remember the original Jurassic Park, the, uh, the wealthy uh, visionary who created uh, the park and decided to wake up dinosaurs? Um, you know, more to the point, to the line of his, to his famous line from the uh, movie. Um, well, this, I, I don't think that, yeah, Dr. Ian Malcolm isn't the proprietor. He's, uh, he's the mathematician, right? Um, looking around at, at, at faces that are like, there was a, a, a Jurassic Park movie from the 1990s. Uh, um, anyway, yeah, Dr. Ian Malcolm is the, uh, a mathematician who was questioning things. And so his line was, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. And then it, the student stated um, that we are pushing forward quicker than we should, causing us to leave the Tao um, more than we already have. And and this is an engineering ethics class. And um, some of them uh, um, are, you know, highly, highly engaged in the work. And some of them um, don't know what to make of, of philosophy and that sort of thing. And I was in their position uh, many uh, years ago, but many of them are going to go work on AI models. Uh, even the mechanical engineers, future mechanical engineers, may be working on mechatronics and instantiating AI models into humanoid robots. And um, there's a lot of questions around, should we, um, that uh, you know this generation is going to be facing. Is there any, in, in the context of that non-question, knowing you have a captive audience of future engineers learning about ethics. Um, is there any uh, direct wisdom you want to share? Well, first of all, um, I don't know who wrote that question, but um, I, I love them. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely subscribe to the sentiment that we're pushing on faster than we know what we're doing. And we are not observing the natural flow and movement of the Tao, but are forcing the pace in a most extraordinary way. Um, it, how organisms survive is by testing something a little, and, and then perhaps being able to push it a little bit further and so on. But they don't take um, extraordinary steps that could completely um, upend a civilization and uh, could cause enormous grief to humanity um, without being sure up to a point of what it is they're going to say is enough and that yeah that's okay but before we go any further let's think about what we're doing I mean the trouble is that in a world that's highly competitive there's a bit of a zero-sum game you know in which um, the feeling is if we don't push this, then someone else will. And there's only one end to that, which is um, 
that we will destroy ourselves, I believe. So I think that the wiser voices are those who say we need to reflect on what we're doing and what our values are, what we're trying to achieve here. And often, of course, what we try to achieve is not what we end by achieving. That's one of the lessons of history and one of the lessons of life. So I'm a natural pragmatist. I think what we need is not more power, which is what AI gives us. I mean, that's all it gives us is more power, but more wisdom. And I don't think any machine will ever give us wisdom. In fact, I think the way to wisdom is to distance yourself from the mechanistic and the mechanical world. And for once allow a much richer world of spirit and humanity to speak to you. So in brief, that's my, my position on, on that. I, I'm ashamed to add that I, I've never seen Jurassic Park, but um, I, <laughs> it's not because I don't think it would be interesting. It's just frankly, lack of time, really. I, there are so many films and so many books if I swivel the camera around, you'd see this book, which is just my workspace, not my library, absolutely filled with stacks of books, about 300 on the floors and the tables. I just don't have enough time. I have a question that I think relates to the power stuff, but uh, maybe we'll succeed this time. Um, so are you wary of people who are especially confident, who sort of go about things as if they know the complexities of life or I mean, do you think that uh, self-confidence in a sense is, is an illusion, uh, a mistake essentially? Uh, let's see if I have any other, Oh yeah. The follow-up is, are there any other qualities that, you, that you would sort of gravitate toward among human beings, um, that are perhaps better qualities to have? Yes. Well, of course, we need a degree of self-belief. Um, and indeed, no culture can survive without self-belief, which is one of the things that worries me about the way we're disemboweling ourselves as a culture and committing suicide, effectively. <laughs> but, um, but it is the value of the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere is always right. Uh, it never crosses its mind that it might be at fault. It's always someone else's fault if something goes wrong. And I, I'm not speaking just metaphorically here. Uh, in, in my work, you, you'll see many cases of people who, after a right hemisphere stroke, therefore relying on their left hemisphere, are completely convinced that everything is fine, that a, a paralyzed arm is not paralyzed. It's working fine. And if you force them to acknowledge that this thing cannot be moved, they will then say, well, it's not my arm. It belongs to you, doctor, or it belongs to that person on the other side of the ward or whatever it may be. So the left hemisphere is super, super confident. And when one hemisphere at a time can be isolated, psychologists have administered a, um, a psychological questionnaire, a, a character profile questionnaire to uh, the person one hemisphere at a time, and also to their relatives and friends. And what this reveals is that the left hemisphere has a very high opinion of itself compared with that held by everyone else. Whereas the right hemisphere has a slightly more tarnished view of itself than is held by other people, although it's more realistic. But overconfidence is of course um, dangerous. And we know uh, you can gather this without doing psychological research, but nonetheless, there is something known to psychologists as the Dunning-Kruger effect, which basically states that those who don't know very much think they know everything. And those who know a lot realize how very little they know. So uh, an excess of self-confidence is, is very dangerous and is, of course, a delusion. Um, there are no certainties in this world except one that anyone who believes there are certainties is certainly wrong. So that, that, that's, that's, that's the, way, the way it is. And I'm also wary of people who are absolutely certain about any matter, um, including spiritual matters. I, I, I have to respect their experience and so forth, but there's always a question mark in my mind 
of what's being ignored, what's being ruled out by people who are completely certain about things. So the way I was trained was to be able to see one side of a question and then answer the, argue the other side of the question at least as forcefully. Uh, and I think that's a good training. In classical Greek, um, I'm not expecting you to be fluent in classical Greek, but, but there is, there is a, a sentence structure which goes men on the one hand, de on the other. And this equally harmonious ability to see that there are two sides to every question was a very important aspect of the founding of that philosophically incredibly subtle civilization. So um, the answer in short to the first part of the question is, yes, I do mistrust people who have excessive self-confidence. The values I respect in people and I think would immeasurably enhance the quality of our lives as, as a society and as a human race would be if we were able to rediscover three important things, compassion for others rather than constant aggression, anger, self-righteousness, um, narcissism, but actually a bit of understanding that other people aren't necessarily stupid because they hold a different view from you. A second would be to be able to appreciate the awe and wonder that's in the world rather than thinking all the time about how very clever we are and the, the the bit that we understand is small compared with what we don't understand as william james said our knowledge is a drop but our ignorance is an ocean and i i think that those are rather important um qualities for anyone really a bit of humility basically a sense of awe and a sense of compassion. So I'm going to paraphrase this question a little bit. Um, so the, I mean, the whole the whole thesis of of your book, the uh, Master and the Emissary, even in the title, the the right hemisphere, when things are in balance, the right hemisphere, uh, you know, is in charge, so to speak, and the left hemisphere uh, is doing a good job to help find things and 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 take action yeah. in the world. And that we have gotten out of that balance with this artificial world that we create, uh, that created this feedback loop. Uh, and if we don't get out of a left hemispheric imbalance, it could be the doom of our civilization. Um, but the question uh, is an interesting one: is while a in your thesis a balanced hemispheric approach is really kind of a right hemisphere as the true leader. Mm. It, is there, and you, you've talked about uh, whether it's TMS or, or stroke victims, I mean, w where people actually have a seriously reduced uh, left hemisphere, how, uh, how that manifests. But i um, curious, and, and, and what this question's getting at, I think, is culturally, is it possible to have a right hemispheric dominant culture, the way we have a left hemispheric dominant culture, but to an extreme, to a, is, there, is there a pathology uh, uh, of uh, relying too little on the left? In theory, they could, of course. But actually what happens is this never occurs because there is this important difference. The right hemisphere understands the importance of what it is the left knows and welcomes it and reincorporates it into what it knows. That is the proper dynamic of the relationship. But it doesn't, it's not reflected because the left hemisphere doesn't understand the importance of what the right hemisphere knows, which is very much more than it understands, and therefore thinks it knows the whole scoop. And <laughs> it, it takes on the mantle of the master when it really hasn't got the knowledge or the character to be able to take on that role. That is the meaning in the title of my earlier book, The Master and His Emissary. And, and interestingly, I found it in um, in, in a legend of the Onondaga people who are part of the Iroquois nation in America. Uh, and long, long before um, any neurologists came along and knew much about the two hemispheres, they have a myth about the relationship between two brothers, an unequal relationship between one that one might call the good brother and the other brother who is 
okay as long as he he's kept under the surveillance of the wiser other brother they have this difficult relationship they mustn't get too close because otherwise the good brother's work will be as it were spoiled by the by the the less good brother but they have to be close to a certain degree uh, otherwise the the less good brother the one that's called flint um will will run away with things and cause damage so, so in some ways this is rather like the structure of the brain because the corpus callosum enables um both communication and inhibition between the hemispheres and getting this balance right is quite an interesting process it, it, i might just add though that there's one or two interesting things have come up recently where if you suppress the left frontal lobe particularly the left medial frontal lobe um there's, there's several lines of evidence on this now you can find that the brain has talents or capacities that in the normal state it doesn't have this can be done either by tms the normal way transcranial magnetic stimulation or by a number of other techniques in which you temporarily disable one hemisphere at a time but what you find then is that um if you like savant talents talents that are only occasionally um come to the fore sometimes after an, a head injury usually an injury to the left frontal lobe where people suddenly have a insight into the solution to problems uh, suddenly become a certain kind of math genius and so forth so it is interesting i hold the view for what it's worth that the brain doesn't emit consciousness it doesn't even transmit consciousness so much as it permits con consciousness in other words it forms and shapes consciousness which comes through it and that therefore the the, the business of the brain is largely about filtering it's about filtering things out and if you damage that filter then some things come through that don't normally come through for most of us in our daily lives so people are able to have sometimes um, knowledge of a kind that we call parapsychological if they have had a front left uh, um left frontal lobe injury so, and correct me if I'm wrong, but is it fair to say that there's a certain, um, almost like an anti-intellectualism in your arguments? Uh, are, are you sort of moving for um, human beings sort of living in a more spontaneous or, or instinctive manner than they currently do? Well... Um, there's some truth in that. I certainly wouldn't call myself anti-intellectual. It would be a bit of a conundrum <laughs> um, for me. Uh, but, and people often say to me, you know, for somebody who um, seems to champion the right hemisphere, a lot of your work is enormously left hemispheric, by which they mean um, I, I do a lot of hard science and i write uh, intelligible logical prose but I, I never said that there was something wrong with the left hemisphere it's important it's just that it should never be the one that takes over and rules the roost so um you know as i sometimes say the left hemisphere is my second favorite hemisphere you know i wouldn't be without it so uh, i i i know what's being got at there but i think you know what's interesting is that when you come to look at the history as i have done of discoveries major discoveries by scientists and mathematicians and sometimes also philosophers they are made partially in an intuitive way they do a certain amount of sort of donkey work and um, but it's not doing the donkey work that gets them to their goal it's a sudden insight in which things are reconfigured and if they aren't able to listen to their intuitions and see new forms or gestalten as the germans say which means a whole that cannot be decomposed into its parts without significant loss unless they're able to see those things as well as do simple procedural work they won't become great scientists or mathematicians so i'm definitely not against intellectuals though i think sometimes intellectuals can be 
and what's best described as clever sillies, i.e. that they're, they're clever all right, but they don't really know how to use what they've learnt and come to some very silly conclusions about what would be good for humanity. So I, I can't resist but chase one, one squirrel uh, at, at the risk of uh, losing everybody, but I'm super curious uh, as a psychiatrist. Um, there's a therapy method uh, that's got a lot of traction in the U.S. I'm not, I'm not sure uh, if it's made it over the Atlantic. And it's a psychodynamic um, uh, sort of neo, neo-Freudian approach. Um, but the process itself makes me think of inner hemispheric stuff. And I'm, I'm super curious if you've heard of EMDR, which is used as a uh, Oh, yes. Trauma. Yes, I have. I, I know. I've worked with the MDR therapists. Yes. So, um, for 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 the audience, the r- roughly speaking, if you if if you have a, a trauma, PTSD, one of the things, very, very simply, uh, uh, there's more to it than this, obviously. But you do an eye movement back and forth. You do a sort of c- a controlled saccade, um, and there's a, and there's mm-hmm. ways to do it with your body as well while you're sort of reliving and processing the trauma um, mm-hmm. that's giving you PTSD and empirically there's a lot of people that absolutely swear by it and and it's gotten a lot of traction and and i've struggled with the psychodynamic framing of it and i can't help but think are you doing some sort of um visual spatial inner inner hemispheric processing by going through the hemifields back and forth and if that's if they can somehow uh um i don't know uh, sort of lubricate a kind of interaction to deal with what might be a, a discordance between the hemispheres on the actual traumatic event or do you have, have any thoughts in that matter? And and if not, we'll get off this uh, squirrel chasing. No, no, I certainly do. As I say, I I have myself had patients who I've recommended EMDR to, and they've done very well with it. Um, interestingly, Yark Panksepp, who uh, unfortunately died a couple of years ago, but was the world's greatest authority on effective neuroscience, um, himself um had an experience after which he had emdr and he said it worked wonderfully well on him Uh, he wasn't really interested and to be very frank nor am i in psychodynamic explanations of it i think that's probably barking up the wrong tree what we do know is that um, there is a if you like a switch in the tegmentum of the midbrain, which is uh, not the middle of the brain, but is the name for the top part of the brain stem, um, which uh, on a millisecond to millisecond level is um, sending stimuli to, to one or other hemisphere. And I think that what happens in trauma is that the right hemisphere is very powerfully um fired up and eventually becomes stuck and there are only two alternatives for it um and these can be seen in following a patient with ptsd that often there's an early phase of dysfunction because of as it were um un unfettered emotional release and then it can be followed by a period of cold attachment in which because it's too painful all affect is cut off now these are both extreme positions and for health one doesn't want either to be swamped by um, unhelpful emotions or to be cut off from emotion but i think that what this eye movement uh, process does is to it's, it's a bit like if i may put it this way, and I'm not being disrespectful, it's a bit like kicking the washing machine. You know, it doesn't go, you give it a boot, and ah, it's working again. We don't really know what happened there, but I think that what, what it was released, it was no longer stuck. So the PTSD patient is stuck, as it were, with a dysfunctional relationship with the right hemisphere. And because of this need to keep going backwards and forwards between, with the hemispheric switch, it is freeing it up again. That's, that's all I can say about it. And that's a speculation, but all we have at the moment is speculation. And I think it's as good a speculation as any. So this is related to the last question, which is, are there ways of sort of restoring a more useful collaboration between the two hemispheres? Um, for example, could you 
speak less or speak more slowly or could you expose yourself to eastern philosophy or are there other ways of sort of creating a more healthy relationship between the two hemispheres yes absolutely um and and i think i i detect somebody who who knows that the answer is in that question that there are at least some of the answer so in learning meditation or mindfulness meditation particularly one of the features is stilling um the chatter of the left hemisphere you know what's known as monkey mind uh, and uh, that process of stopping constantly commenting on making judgments about um and, and verbalizing about what one's experiencing I mean, that whole process is disruptive of being there with experience. And, and one distinction I make between the right and left hemispheres is that broadly speaking, the right hemisphere allows us to be in the presence of something or that thing to presence to us, to use a sort of philosophical language there. Whereas the left hemisphere deals in representations, which literally means being present after the fact when they're actually no longer present and the digest of the left hemisphere into ideas that it's already familiar with yes i know about this yes i read something about that no i think i know about this and the, the combination of preformed concepts and language has to be stilled if one's to be able to regain that business of simply being in the presence of the world so um bang on whoever it was who 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 said um eastern philosophies and eastern practices i think these are very important i think actually that mindfulness meditation should be taught in schools um and i think it should become part of the practice of most people but there are other things one can do which are if you're lucky enough as i am to live surrounded by dramatic beautiful nature to spend time in it but you know even if there's just a park nearby where you can go and see things growing and doing their natural thing and switch off from your phone from your busy schedule from your mind from the rest of what's going on and be present to the natural world that helps enormously i think spending time to listen to music and read poetry thoughtfully mindfully not rushing through it because you've got an appointment <laughs> not trying to combine listening to music with writing um, a piece of work but actually spending the time with whatever it is it will be amply rewarded by what it speaks to you uh, i think half the, the the difficulty is that we are always crowding out the mental space by doing the talking whereas really the art of approaching a kind of wise way of living a life is to allow the world to speak to you and hear for the first time what's going on and sometimes that really does take discipline not to rush in to a conclusion but to suspend making a judgment about what exactly is going on here and listening and attending and if you do that then you will find that things do speak to you at first perhaps slightly more tentatively and more difficult to pick up but over time that voice can be strengthened and i think that is that is something very important yes thank you very much for a very good question so th this question relates to uh, emotions in the hemispheres and i'm going to broaden the question a bit so, so you, you talked about the left hemispheres you know is more uh, is more likely to express emotions in uh, with things like anger i mean it's the agentic side the dopaminergic side it's the one taking action in the world it's going to get frustrated if it can't re uh, achieve its goals and it's going to energize the body to burst through those things makes sense the right hemisphere um is the relational uh, the empathetic um grief and sadness are more likely to manifest uh, with the right hemisphere um but anger rage uh you know grief and dis even you know despair uh, from a great loss i mean these, these can be very debilitating emotions um is knowing um to some extent understanding uh, where these emotions are coming from hemispherically does that inform 
uh, what somebody can do for an um, emotional regulation standpoint if they're in a state of profound grief that's that's too devastating or they or they are prone to uh, anger management issues is there is, is is there a hack or is there a deep wisdom that comes from knowing that this is actually from one side of your brain I wouldn't say it was a hack um, and obviously if you're in the throes of a a devastatingly powerful emotion through a, a grievous loss or whatever it may be. Um, probably nothing I can say will think of it like this will, will help at that moment. But I think that in incorporating into one's world picture that certain, you see, the idea used to be that the left hemisphere was cool and rational and dependable and the left hemisphere was emotional and irrational, but creative. All of that is complete. Sorry, I, I, I don't know how. Over here, we use swear words quite a lot, but I think Americans are much more polite. But anyway. Um, this is North Dakota. So, it uh, probably be pretty good. <laughs> um, so th none of this is true. Um, but what there is, is a difference in the way in which they contribute to reason and a difference in the kind of emotional spectrum. And the spectrum that attached to the left hemisphere is, as you say, is that of, of anger, self-righteousness, um, um, a, a, a kind of um, self-justification, narcissistic sort of frame of mind. And if one realizes what that is in one's less troubled moments, that might help one to move away from it seeing that it's neither intelligent nor productive and will only succeed in trapping you into a place that is unproductive. One of the things that um, people, you know, speaking as a psychiatrist, people often feel is they mustn't let go of their anger um, because somehow they're excusing someone else. Um, but who are you hurting by your anger? Only yourself. Who would you benefit by forgiving them only yourself if you want to look after yourself these are things that one was taught when one was young but thought oh that's all pious nonsense but actually is correct is forgive people let things go don't hang on tenaciously to the sense that you've been wronged if you have a long enough life you'll be wrong many times um and you'll no doubt wrong other people. So it's really coming to a more balanced view of what we, what we know, who we are, and what we can do. And once you get into the relational, the idea of actually this is not just an object of hatred, but it's somebody that um, I can relate to who's another human being who also suffered, and their behavior may be caused by that suffering. We just don't know what's going on inside another person's head or another person's life then that is a, a good step forward. Do you think that the people who move to urban areas tend to be more um, left lateralized or sort of leftish in their style and, um, and versus people, and I know you live in a very rural area there in mm. Isle of Scott, are, are there people, people who sort of gravitate to more rural areas, mm. are they, it, does that reinforce sort of a more sort of right hemispheric mode of living with the world? Well, I think, yes, it does somewhat. I mean, if you imagine until 1800, certainly, and perhaps even slightly later, almost everyone in the world would live in close proximity to the natural world. The, the habitat would be thrust into and grown out of the rather the, the 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 natural world it's a very very odd state of affairs that we've got that we've become removed from it and you know even when you think of cities like ancient athens and ancient rome these were tiny and, and you could see from the walls the countryside coming right up to the wall uh, nowadays it would be rather like going on a holiday to some romantic rural village so this modern megalopolis is a very odd thing and we're not really designed for it so i believe yes that 
it does help one to reintegrate that right hemisphere. And there's some, uh, some reason to believe that left hemisphere um, way of thinking is incubated by being surrounded by an entirely artificial, rigid, rectilinear, non-living landscape. And uh, so, yes, what more can I say? Dr. McElchris, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And if you ever want to drop by North Dakota, please do. Um, there's a resurgence of right hemispheric thinking going on all across the strait, I'm sure you would enjoy. Uh, but thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, thank you. Yep. Thank you, too. Thank yep. you very much. I hope it's been of interest anyway. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much.